Welcome back to Reading Bear. Today, we will take a look at some new Pori Ranch stories. And if you enjoyed my content, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and post some bear emojis in the comments. Let's go! The first one is titled, The Inappropriate Assistant Manager. My assistant manager was making inappropriate gestures and remarks towards young women who would come into the store. He's morbidly obese and that's not an exaggeration. He's also very creepy. He would schedule himself off work often instead of putting in a vacation request. He was constantly scheduling people for impossible shifts and would leave it up to us to trade around and fix his mistakes. He would steal sales by sending away other sales people and do large returns on other people's counter numbers in order to boost his reported sales numbers. He would give ridiculous deals and even free stuff to his friends. And he was an all-around lazy turd. One day I got tired of hearing about yet another scheduling error and that he was on vacation again, so I told my co-worker that I was going to the office and if I couldn't find a vacation request, I was going to call our district manager. Lo and behold there isn't a request so I start looking for the phone number when I found a neat little HR report form on the company website. Being an English major, I figured that now was my time to shine so I wrote out the most professional accusation of incompetence and ineptitude I could. I made sure to include his inappropriate comments about customers and staff as well. Not even a week later HR and our district and regional managers were in our store conducting interviews. He was gone that day cried like a baby, too. This list of grievances doesn't do it justice but, believe me, he deserved every bit of it. The next one is titled, You don't want to pay for repair, I guess I'll see you in court. This is the story of my first auto accident. For context, I have always loved classic cars. My first car was a 1979 Dodge Magnum GT, but it died on me and I couldn't get it to work again. I sold it for scrap in late October 2017, and I saved every penny I could to get another classic car. I went without eating during my lunches at work. I was dedicated to getting a classic car. I was in 11th grade at the time so I could only work 24 hours a week at 9.50 an hour, so by the time I had 3000 saved up I was ready to find a car. I found a 1974 Pontiac Catalina in late March 2018. It was a Pontiac 400 cubic inch V8, de restricted, removing emission control systems. It's legal in Michigan, given performance parts like an Edelbrock carburetor and was paraded around as a show car across the state. I was in love, everything from the maroon paint and white vinyl roof to the aftermarket police hubcaps. I bought it and it was my crowning achievement so far in life. Fast forward a few months. I had been driving the Catalina daily every day since I bought it and I was planning on going on a road trip around Lake Michigan later in the summer. It was the last summer break of high school and I wanted to celebrate by doing this grand road trip. It was the day before my 18th birthday. It was a nice day to go cruising around in a 70s land yacht. I pull up to an intersection close to my house on. I was driving and both of my parents were in the car. We stop at the intersection at a green light because an early 2000s F-150 was trying to do an illegal turn. Michigan has a weird road design thing called the Michigan Turnaround. This isn't the first time I saw someone do this so I didn't think twice. I look up and the light turned yellow. I said aloud, I'm going to wait this light out, I don't want to get out there when the light turns red. And then the entire car lurches forward. I immediately shifted into park and get out. A red 02 or 03 Pontiac Montana, undamaged, had bumped into my Catalina, damaged. We pulled into a Denny's and wait for the police to arrive. I chat with my mum about what I can do. She told me about a mini tort claim, it was the only thing I could do with PLPD insurance. I could only go after the other driver if I had over a $1,000 in damages on my car. I went around my hometown and found a single shop that would even attempt to work on my Catalina, and their estimate was $16.75. I couldn't believe it, and he was even knocking $200 off because I knew him. With this I was able to start a mini tort claim. A week goes by and I get a call from an unknown number. I like to duck with the phone scammers who say my warranty is out of date. I answer and the call went something like this. Insurance company rep, hello is this op? 
Me, yay, why? Insurance company rep, I see you issued a claim about an accident involving a Catalina. Me, yes, I did. Insurance company rep, well, the person who hit you doesn't have that on his policy. Me, what does that mean? Will I get any money from him? Insurance company rep, nope, have a great day. Hangs up. I panicked and was nearly late to work trying to figure out what was going on. I called my insurance company and they told me to sue. I had a cut and dry case and I would get the same amount of money if I sued, so that's what I did. I gathered everything I needed and filed the claim with the small claims court. A month and a half later, court date. This is the first time I could talk to him directly and not through insurance companies. The judge asks me, my parents, P, the other driver, D, and his girlfriend, DG, to step into a small room to see if we can settle the matter privately. His girlfriend starts the conversation at me, I was the only one who sat down for this. DG, you were in the intersection when we hit you, you should have gone through the light. D, and where did you get the $1,675 figure? I hit a tree going 40 when I was your age and it only cost me $800. P, the age of the vehicle is the reason the repair cost is so high. Me, you also made the bummer cut through fiberglass moldings on both sides, you bent the frame and bent the entire bumper up. Not only is it an outdated platform but I need to get 1974 parts because that's the only body panels that will fit. The age and rarity of the parts is what caused the prices to be higher in this case. DG, well you shouldn't have been driving a car that old. Me, you shouldn't have assumed that I would have gone through the yellow light. We didn't come to an agreement before the trial. I went into the courtroom expecting a long and heated legal battle. The case didn't even last five minutes. The judge said to D, you both saw the truck do the illegal turn, and you both saw the yellow light. D should have slowed due to an obstruction and op stopped because of it. It is law in the state of Michigan to stop at a yellow light if it is safe to do so. The case goes to the plaintiff, me. The court is adjourned. D is still paying me his installment checks to this day. The last one is titled, Where is my car? This is a long one, of what happens if you really piss off a prankster, some of the finer details may have been lost in time, as this story is about 30 y old, but I will tell it as good as I remember, and have not changed anything of the spirit of the story. I work as a new pipe fitter and was on a job where they were building a big office building of about 25 floors, smack in the middle of town, and was lucky to be on site both times when this story unfolded. So me and my colleague had to lay a six gas pipe for the building's heating. This was a two-phase job where we first had to run the gas pipe into the building during the rough phase, and install a valve with a blind for safety reasons, and then come back months later just before they start heating the building to install the last part and place the gas meter itself. Day one, we come on site, and as you aspect, parking is hell, as the building is in the center of Rotterdam, Holland. Me and two ground workers and equipment got dropped off and my colleague parks the van five minutes away. We got told to report to the site manager, so we wait for my colleague as he was led and a lot more experienced than me then, and I was still learning finer parts of the trade under him, he was a nice easy going patient guy who trained all the new guys. And when he is also there, we go to site manager to hear what he has to say, what he wants, and get the do's and don'ts of the site. We come to his office, and my colleague knocks on the door and gets in, and he is on the phone and tells us to get a coffee, he would be right with us. Fifteen minutes pass and my colleague thinks he properly forgotten all about us, noting strange, site managers are busy guys, so he goes to the guy again, and gets told to wait some more, this happens three more times, and by the fourth time we are just about over an hour on site. And so my colleague has enough of it, and walks into his office and stays there, as we can't wait all day. Then the side manger explodes, can't you see I am on the phone, wait outside till I have ducking time for you. My colleague, okay, so you don't want gas to your nice new building, okay then, we are leaving again, and I explain to the gas company why we are leaving here now. Good luck getting gas anytime soon, no one shouts at me like that for no good reason, after having me wait for over an hour, he walks out of the door and tells us, we are leaving. We start walking, and outside the site manager, from here on name the butt or douchebag, catches up to us, and start to humbly apologize, and says that the job is a mess and so on. Colleague accepts his apologies but tells him that the next time we're gone, we talk about the job, and get our intro of the site. 
Little explanation why the guy was suddenly so nice to my colleague, as we were just lowly contractor workers, and hired by the gas company. The people at the gas company are nice people to work for, with, and mostly always willing to help, cooperate as much they could. But if they would hear what the guy did, they would side with us, and take their time, and enforcing all the rules, also he would have had to pay our day that day, as commercial connections have to pay for installation labor and materials, and they could be nasty if they wanted to be, as they knew, you needed them, they did not need you. By that time it's break time, and in the canteen, we hear that the guy is a real douchebag, and that he shouts all the time against anyone who's below him, and that it's always his way or the highway, and no one had a good word to say about him, other than, he does finish his projects on time. So after the break, we started our job, the guys started to dig the trench, and we started to drill a big hole through the foundation for the gas pipe to get in. As we are busy, one of the ground workers get to us, and tells my colleague that the cars need to be moved soon, as they are standing on top of where the trench is coming. My colleague asked one of the carpenters working close to us, who he had to ask for, for moving the cars for today, and said tomorrow they can park there again. He said he would arrange it for us, because he likes to tell the a-hole that he had to move his car off-site, at least 5 properly 10 minutes away from site, as the center is getting busier, and he liked to see his face all steamy when he tells him. But after a minute or so, the guy comes back, and asks if we are in a real rush. I said to him, nah, we still need about 30 minutes, but lunch is in 45, so after lunch is also fine with us. He says okay, and even today I can still see him grinning from ear to ear, with eyes that says that he is up to no good. As it were the only five parking spots on site, it will be a pain for all the guys that were allowed to park there and move their cars off site in the middle of the day, when the city center was filled up with cars. After couple of minutes, he comes back with a shovel and starts digging four shallow parallel trenches about 20 centimeters, eight deep on a place bit out of the way, in soft sand where you can't park. After 5 minutes he is finished, and comes back with a big heavy duty almost 20 foot long pallet on a forklift, and put it down. And the 4 big crossbeams under the pallet fit right into the 4 hole he had dug, after that he stacks up some wood in front of the pallet making a ramp and walks away, and it now looks like nice parking spot. After that, all the office people parked there started to move their cars including the douchebag. Only he did not drive his big car away, but parks it on top of the pallet, and go back in again, as it's break time now. We also go in again, and have lunch and warm up. When we get back, we see there is a wooden cover over the pallet and so the pallet is now a crate, so we walk to the carpenter and ask what's he up to. He says, you just wait and see, but don't talk about it. 15 minutes or so later the tower crane comes and lifts the crate to something like let's say the 20th floor, and the crate is put it there. And then we see the carpenter put a similar pallet as before back in the same spot. A little later that day we see they put the mold to pour the concrete over the crate for the next floor of the building. After seeing this, we ask the carpenter if he hated the guy that much to something like that. He said, yeah, I gave him once some lip, because he was a pain. As revenge, he fired his son over some beginner's mistakes that he made, when he was still in his trail period, and got him, above that, also blacklisted at the company for 10 years, when he was still training him to become a good master carpenter like him. Working with his son was something he wanted to do, he also been thinking of quieting and start somewhere else to work with his son and train his son there. But he worked at the company for 25 years and would lose a lot of benefits and security, and he also didn't want to give the douchebag the satisfaction that he quit. He also told us that the douchebag was the most likely one to park on the pallet, as walking was far below him. We talked some more about him and things he did and agreed the guy was in a whole first class. Day 2, the next day we are told to wait in the canteen after the first break, where then after break time, the douchebag and the police walk in and are standing in front of us, and he tells that his 2 month old Mercedes Benz 500 SEC, an 85k car 30 years ago, 200k in 2019 dollars, where he had been waiting for for 7 months was stolen, and if anyone had seen something. The whole room started softly laughing. After that, we got also questioned by the police, as we worked close by, but we also said we did not see a thing, as we were not paying attention. We finished what we have to do, and are finished that day, we go back to our shop and have a laugh about the car on our way back, thinking this will be the end of the story. 
Forward about eight months or so, the outside of the building has been finished, and we come back on that site to finish up the last bit of the gas pipe and install the gas meter itself. So this time it's only the two of us now on this job. We go to the site manager, who is now very friendly from the start with us this time, and we briefly discuss what we are going to do, and we say that if everything fits we are done today, as all is prefabbed in the shop. So we start working on getting the pipe in place. During our first break, we walk into the canteen and see the carpenter sitting and we go sit next to him, and ask, we saw that the douchebag found his car back, as we had seen a same colored Mercedes Benz 500 SEC standing when came on the job. And he says, nope not the same car, but let us not talk about it here, he says. I heard three weeks ago that you guys were coming back. As I heard the heat is going to be turned on this week, to dry out the building, and hoped it would be you guys again. After the break he tells us to come with him, and we take the lift to the 20th floor, and there he opens a locked big office room with working space for about 15 to 20 people, and there he stands, the Mercedes Benz 500 SEC, all polished up and all, on a finished floor, and standing on 4 by 8 meters, yards or so, of some nice looking red carpet, surrounded by 4 big lamps, like it was on display in a showroom. We both looked at him in amazement, and asked him how he had done it, he told us the whole sorry from beginning to end, after we left last time. The crate had just been standing there all the time he only covered it with plastic and had put labels on it, that the crate could only be opened after the building had a dry in status, things they do more if the equipment is hard to get in later. And that sometime later he jacked up the crate and put it on stands when they were pouring the finishing floor. And after the floor was hardened he had lowered the crate and they had filled up the holes. He had taken the last Friday off, it was Wednesdays by now I think, taken of the crate, broken into the car. He had found someone, and learned during those 8 months how to break into it without damaging it, he told us, rolled the car of the pallet, disassembled the pellet, put down the carpet, and rolled the car back on it. After that he had been polishing and cleaning the car and room for the rest of the day. He even had gotten a spray can of fresh car smell, and used it in the car, and changed the parking money for useless foreign coins, just to piss him off. He told us that foreman of the floors was a long friend of his, and also hated the douchebag's guts, and was his only accomplice, and no one else knew what he had done and that we were the only other ones who knew what he had done, so he liked to share the experience with us and told us two weeks ago, douchebag had gotten his new Mercedes Benz 500 SEC, as we had seen it outside, and all this time he had been riding in a, small, 200 series loaner he did not like. He said it's now the right time to give him his car back, and he told us that he had postponed his revenge a week just for us. He then asked us to take a couple of photos of him sitting in the car, him sitting in the car with a blow-up doll next to him, and him hanging over the hood. As in about 10 years, he would be retired and the statute of limitations would have then run out, and he would have liked to then give the photos to him. Then he placed the doll behind the wheel, locked the car, and we walked out of the room leaving the door open, and him dragging two power cords with him and plugging them in a power box, and we see that the room is lit up with the 4x1000 watt halogen lamps. And then he says, let's go to the top floor, and letting things happen for about 10 minutes and then we come back, and then he should be there. Then in about another 5 to 10 minutes, we take the elevator to the top floor, there we walk behind him, and go up a pair of stairs, and we end up at the door to the roof, but then there he goes to the machine room of the elevator, he looks at the control display for a minute or so, and when the lifts are all standing still, he turns the power off, puts a lock on it, and hangs up a card, do not operate, and then we go back down again. We're taking our time getting back down to the 20th floor and we hear laughter as we come closer by, and then there are about 50 guys in the hallway and the room where the car is standing, all laughing their butt off. With the lights on it, the car looked like it belonged in a car brochure, the only thing wrong with it, was blow up doll behind the wheel. And yes, after about 5 plus minutes the douchebag comes storming into the room, sweating like a pig, as he had just run his fat butt up all the 20 floors, walking into the room with eyes as big as I only have seen in cartoons. He is standing there for about 1 minute or so breading hard, sweating and swearing and cursing, till he finally noticed there are about 50 or maybe by now even 60 to 70 guys standing around, and laughing at him. I see him getting red until in his neck from anger, and he starts swearing again and tells that anyone that is not gone in 10 seconds, is gone be fired. So we all walk away, as the show is over, but man it had been one hell of a show.
Later in the day the carpenter comes by again, and we have laugh again. We also heard he had fired two people that had come later by, that had laughed out loud after seeing the car with the doll still sitting in it, as it was still locked, when he was still there. We had some more talk and laughs, and my colleague asked the guy for his number, as he wanted a follow-up, as this was too good not to have any, and we said our goodbyes. Though because of all the commotions and talking, we had to do 30 minutes or so of unpaid overtime on a 5-6 to six hour job, but we did not mind at all. A couple of weeks later, my colleague had phoned the guy to ask what the fallout had been. The two fired guys were back the next day on the job again, as HR had turned back their termination, as it would have been a very costly wrongful termination. And the car had been chopped up by two mechanics from Car Junkyard, taking three days to do it, and it was sold for parts, as there was no other way to get it out of the building. Also, many from the head office had been by, including the CEO, to look at the car standing on the 20th, humiliating the douchebag some more. He also told him, that he had printed the photos and they were good, and that he had made photocopies of it, with him sitting behind the wheel with the blow-up doll next to him, but with his face covered with a smiley sticker, and hang them up through the whole building in the strangest places, and the douchebag got steamy every time he found one. And that he now has been suspecting him pretty much to be the one who did it, after a week or so, as it was all something he would do, as they know one and another for over 20 years, and have history, but without proof, he can't do anything. What I learned of this, as I have been sitting on the front seat of this show, two things, revenge is best severed ice and ice cold, and to never piss off a prankster. Thanks for listening.